Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Armor CD32 History Special. Now, before we jump uh, into the episode, I thought we'd just take a look at some pretty good news. Uh, basically, someone, uh, and the timing for this just couldn't be any better, someone is about to release a CD32 paper printed magazines. Now, going through the blurb, it says... Revive the good old days with a physical paper Amiga CD32 magazine and demo disc. Something not seen since 1996. Published bi-monthly, each issue comes with a demo disc containing the latest playable demos, public domain games and the odd scene demo. Let's party like it's 1999. Well, perhaps not quite that recent. Okay, let's party like it's 1994. It's about to go on sale, sorry, uh, available for pre-orders from the 2nd of July. So by the time you hear this, it should be available. It seems to be priced at around 4 99 You can pre-order at cd32-scene-magazine.onlineweb.shop. I will copy that into the show notes, of course. Now, just before we get on to this week's episode... I'd just like to send out a big thank you to Alessandro Violini for his uh, CD32 pictures. Now we have the full box packing that I've used for the uh, main image on the actual episode, but he did provide me with some decent shots of the back to use as well as the motherboard and the inside and stuff. I was quite happy to be able to use them. I'm not sure where I'll link them in with the episode, but... It's just absolutely fantastic that someone in the community is just so happy to uh, come forward and offer to help out and stuff. Because, you know, I haven't actually got a CD32, I've only got a 1200, so uh, it does help us out with this episode. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank everybody that's donated at patreon.com slash Amigarama. I do post uh, regular show notes up there as well as links to uh, other things each week. So if you want to help the show out and you feel like contributing a bit then please pop along it will be more than welcome well with that out of the way let's move on to the bulk of uh, this week's episode our cd32 special now the first thing we'll have to do is we'll have to look at the the console up close especially its design uh now looking at this first person now i i wasn't actually sure if the color is gray or black it's like an odd mix of the two i think it's a really really dark black this isn't uh, that black, but it's almost grey, so so I'm not sure what quite happened with the shade in there, but uh, uh, <laughs> what can I say, I suppose it, it's plastic colouring of the time. Uh, now, style-wise, it, it always reminds me of the Sega Mega Drive with the big circle uh, on one side, which in this case represents uh, uh, the CD drive. Now, the CD drive itself, it's, it's almost like a tombstone, you know, you flip it up, this massive lid to sit the CD on the middle. Uh, there's a little half moon there with a, a slot peeking through so you can actually see the uh, the CD in action. Uh, you've got like a single button on top, uh, one for the, the volume, a couple of like indicator lights uh, and, and a stereo jack as well. Now, like I said before, it's very, very similar in style to the Sega Mega Drive. And although the, the, the colours are different, just the fact that they share that, that square, that, that rectangular design and that, that, the big circle in the middle, I'm not sure quite why Commodore didn't want to do something different there. It's a very strange design to pick. I mean, this might just be me in the way that I'm looking at it, but the first thing I see it whenever, whenever I look at it is always, is this a Mega CD sort of mixed console? It's a, it's a very odd design choice, but... It's what they went with. What more can you say? Now, the inside of the console, it, it's quite a beast. It really is very powerful. Uh, it's got a Motorola CPU, which is called a, a 68E CO20, uh, which runs at 14.3 megahertz. Now, you compare that to the Mega Drive, which is a similar spec. Well, at the time, I'd assume it was a similar spec system, but that's only got a Motorola 68000. So, they, you know, they're the same sort of chip, uh, chipset there. Uh, which also had a 16-bit uh, CPU. Uh, now, again, this is based on the uh, Amiga 1200, uh, as it, and, and it is consoleized, I suppose, in a way. Memory-wise, it's got 2 megs of Amiga chip, chip RAM, 
Now, most, most systems at the time had around about 128k, so that's a massive, massive boost straight away. And adding the fact that you're running CD stuff from this, uh, it comes with a 1 meg kickstart ROM with specialized CD32 firmware, so that's effectively a bit like a, the Amiga computers kicking off like they would off a floppy disk, and then the CD32 interrupts and then loads it a, a little bit of software. You will, of course, have to excuse me because I am by no means any sort of uh, expert when it comes to this sort of age tech. I'm, I'm sure I might get things wrong as I'm talking and doing comparisons, but I'm doing my best and we'll, we'll see how it, it comes on the other side. Now, the console also came with one kilobyte of flash ROM for uh, uh, for game saves. I mean, that in itself is is not much use. Even for the time, it was it's pathetically small. You could do... Uh, uh, Next to nothing with it, and if you go over to like the standard Amiga when you're saving games, you know that one kilobyte is it's it, pathetic. I mean, you, you know, you, you're looking at in some cases like 100 kilobytes, 200 kilobytes. I'm not entirely sure why uh, they went down that route, but uh, I suspect with the way uh, Commodore operated at the time, it was a, a cost cutting measure and it's just being extremely cheap. But it is quite frustrating because you know, I've been a CD32 owner several times throughout my life and one of the most annoying things is just that amount of, uh, you just can't save the game basically unless you get some sort of add-on or expansion, which is fine if you consider that a lot of these games I suppose, are supposed to be consoleized, but if you start playing things like uh, um, a graphic adventure game which requires, like uh, Beneath the Steel Sky, something like that, you need to have a save game, but it's just one kill, it's just nothing. And anyway, we can go on about that for ages. It's just a di disappointing aspect of the system. Uh, and now, it did use the AGA chipset, which the 1200 is uh, quite famous for. That just uh, allowed it to do uh, a lot more with colours compared to the other Amigas and, and systems at the time, because consoles were not using anything uh, this in debt. Now, keep in mind, we're not really up to like the uh, 3DO era at this point or anything. This was pretty much the first like uh, CD32 system. Uh, video wise it used a 24-bit color palette which led it had uh, up to 16.7 million colors which I'm sure a lot of you would get quite excited about. Uh, it can have up to 256 on-screen colors uh, in something called index mode. Now you compare that to the Sega Mega Drive Genesis and that just had 64. So straight away, you know, there's a huge uh, uh, upgrade there. 262,144 on-screen colors in something called Ham 8 mode with resolutions of up to 1280 by 512. Uh, now audio wise, it had it can have four voices or two channels for stereo. Uh, eight bit resolution and a six bit volume. This, this, all this stuff doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, the CD ROM drive was actually a double speed one. Now, this did surprise me at the time because uh, around about when all these systems were coming up, I'm very used to the, uh, the double speeds being quite poor, real. And I always think of like the, the Neo Geo CD in a particular example because when that was loading, like effectively loading arcade games, it would take absolutely ages, but if you consider the fact that, uh, especially at the time, that like most Amiga games, because you know, a lot of these were like 1200 ports, they, they were on umpteen or so floppy disks, and it really wasn't a lot of it to load. So the, the loading times were not uh, overly long, like, say, you, you get on the uh, Neo Geo CD. The console had loads of input-output connections, in particular the S-Video out on the back, which is not a very common thing for console, will give you a super sharp picture. I suppose it's probably the equivalent of comparing, say, SCART to Composite. There really is a, a sharpness there and, 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 and a big difference. So it's quite impressive, especially with the time. Uh, it's got a comp uh, Composite on the back, so you know, convert that to SCART. Nice and simple. RF uh, with stereo out and uh, something called it Serial AUX port, which allows for like, uh, different types of expansions. Uh, the operating system. Uh, is I think that's tied in with the uh, Kickstart ROM thingy. Uh, that's Amiga OS 3.1 with, uh, with the CD32 firmware running alongside it. Now that's just, it's nothing fancy. It's not like you've got Workbench or anything. When you turn the system on, you get a nice little jingle, a uh, little uh, uh, fancy graphic appears, and Amiga CD32 comes on and uh, there's like a spinning CD with all colours everywhere. 
very, very pretty, very, very simple. The CD32 has a mouse and, con- and control joystick, sorry, controller adapter uh, on the side. Uh, that's basically like your simple nine pin, pretty common at the time. But one thing about it, if you've got uh, an Amiga mouse, you can plug that in and use it as you would an Amiga 1200. But by holding down two buttons on boot up, gives you a nice simple menu. You can select things like uh, PAL, NTSC, very, very handy, especially for the, the, the mix of Amiga games, especially at the time. Display options, nice and simple, uh, uh, and an, an expansion board, diagnostic. Uh, menu that's basically if you've got anything plugged in the back you can uh, test it out and make changes this isn't of course just a simple a1200 that's probably quite luckily they did put uh, something extra in there uh, that's something is something called the akiko chip uh, now again this is only found in the cd32 uh, and it does something called converting chunky to planar routines uh, these converted chunky pixels that Amiga produces uh, to Amiga bit planes, which allowed 3D games. So you're looking at the, the likes of Gloom to run a lot faster. Well, that's what it's supposed to do in theory, but it, 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 it didn't really have the power to produce much in the way of, say, like 3D that the, uh, the PlayStation could do. And I know that was a, a year or two away, uh, and that was much more capable of, of that sort of thing, but, as an aside, as a chip, it was actually quite impressive that that early on, uh, around about the release, that you were getting something capable. And even though at the times a lot of the games makers didn't actually know how to take advantage of it, the fact is the choice was there and it could have been expandable in future. The chip also helps the CD drive to run, uh, as well as the serial uh, AUX ports on the uh, the back of the console. It's a bit of a... a an all for something sort of thing. It, 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 rather than just like bump all that stuff on the, the, the 1200 background that sat in the middle, they've, de- they've dedicated this specific part of this chip to deal with it. I suppose it frees up more system resources for it to actually, well, play more and, and, and better games. Now, it, it's a bit of a mixed bag from what I could find out what games actually used it to any sort of adv- advantage. I mean, there was very, very few at the time uh, Gloom Deluxe definitely used it, uh, Microcosm, uh, and the Wing Commander titles. And, and that's all I could confirm from looking into it. And I did do the usual round, you know, like Wikipedia, lots of articles and things. And I saw lots of hints at things of games it would be possible to use with, but I could never find any sort of real confirmation. And even going across various forums, people were either very confused about it or, it's a very peculiar system, the CD32. It, 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 a lot of people seem to think they know a lot about it, but no one can confirm it for sure. And it's been very, very difficult to try and find out uh, any 100% proof on different things. And I just think because at the time it all depends on the, the, the number that was sold and how deep people have actually gone into it. And they take this attitude of it's like, well, well, it's really just uh, an Amiga 1200 in the box. I mean, I keep saying that myself from time to time, but again, because in one way, yes, it is, but in other ways, it is really a, a separate system. So it, it's how you merge them two together and then come up with uh, people's ideas of it on the other end. Now, I hope I've not lost half of you in the technical details. I know myself when I was trying to compile these that my eyes were glazing a few times uh, over and over again. I'm, I'm not that big into the technical aspects. So I'm mostly about the games and stuff. But again, we, we've tried to cover as much as possible. Uh, but now let's move on to something a bit more interesting. The uh, the controller. And, oh boy, what a controller. It's probably the first controller I've ever really seen to be uh, shaped like a, 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 an upside-down boomerang. I don't know quite how, uh, how to pronounce it. In a way, I suppose it's got that similar sort of curve that the later PlayStation uh, uh, pads had, but especially for the time, it's a very, very uh, uh, bizarre uh, design choice. I'm not 100% sure it actually works. Now, it's got a, a D-pad on it, well, sort of a D-pad, I don't know how, it's, it, it's more like a, a, a single disc with little tacky uh, taps on to uh, catch your thumb. It's very, very weak, and every single time I've had one of these systems, you always have this fear that if you're too 
abusive to the buttons if you press them too far that it will actually break and they are actually quite famous for being really weak and and it, it's not the best really i mean especially at the time you just paid out like uh three or four hundred pounds say for all this system and stuff and you've got this cheap tacky controller and, and it's prone to breaking it's not the best uh it comes with some shoulder buttons uh, it's got four fire buttons, which are green, yellow, blue, and a much bigger red one. I'm not sure what the part behind that, I suppose, in a way. It's similar to the thing they did with the, the GameCube one much, much later. We had, uh, I think it was a big, big yellow circular C button, was it? Or you tell him that, didn't you? I can't remember. Anyway, I'm not that, that great on that pad. But the fact is, you know, it, it's, it, it does stand out. It is a little something different. Instead of like a start and select, it's got a pause play button. I suppose that takes the place of, uh, of well, the start button on other consoles. But at the same time, it, it gives you the option of like if you're playing, I suppose, CD movies, because maybe at the time they were all, they were all thinking, well, everyone's going to be playing these at home. They're the next best things, these CD movies. And it failed, but they failed pretty, pretty, uh, quickly. I will say, you can probably tell this from the tone of it, I am not a fan of this as a controller. It, it's not very good. I don't think it's very comfortable to hold. You really do have to be like a proper like, hardcore Amiga fan to get any sort of enjoyment out of this. Uh, now, I personally feel it's better to stick with like a, a Mega Drive pack. I think you can get them converted or something. You can pretty much buy redone ones. I mentioned it in the past on, on the show because somebody... Uh, Rejigged uh, uh, one of these pad light into a new design. Or you can buy something called like a, a competition pro controller, which has got a lots of like rapid fire and uh, extra buttons and things on it. It's basically a, a souped up Mega Drive pad, and you know, it, it's identical in design. That's a third party one, but you're much much better getting something like that than using the one that comes with it because it, it's just not a, a very good design all round. Prior to launch of the CD32, it was a very funny time for CD-based systems. They were the, the potential was there, you know, lots and lots of space compared to things like carts and floppy disks and things. You know, it, people could see it was the future in the way that things were going to go. Now, Commodore did try prior to this to uh, to dabble in the whole CD market with the uh, the CD TV, but I think that the biggest problem with that is it was you know it was really advanced technology. But it was priced at a really uh, advanced rate as well, of about £699. I mean, that was mouth-watering at the time, and, and next to no one could afford it. And it was an absolute flop, and it completely uh, completely failed. Uh, but at, at the same time, the, de the developers, game developers, program developers they, they didn't really know what to do with, with all the extra space, you know, because it, you, you know, it's like megabytes and megabytes of space on a CD, and you compare that to like a, a floppy disk, and some of the biggest games, even at the time, you know, they're going like 10 to 15 floppy disks, and that's not a lot of space, really. Maximum the compression stuff, you're probably looking about 20 to 30 meg per game. You get a huge CD with like 650 to 700 meg, depending on how it's pressed. And yeah, you know, it's just too much space. They weren't sure what to do with it, and and people were just dabbling. And there was there was a real fear of getting into this market. We just it just wasn't right already at the time. Another aspect of this is piracy it was pretty much a sales destroyer. I mean, you'd see all those adverts in magazines and pushing out on TV and radio and stuff. It really was this this panic from developers because they were losing so much money, you know. A game could be produced and then released them within the same day of it being on the market. Umpteen crackers have come along in the distributing it on, on discs. And I'm, you know, they were quite happy to do it at the time. It was all part of the scene, but the, the, the downside was all these developers really, really were struggling. And though it's quite a, a funny thing now looking back at CD technology at the time, uh, you couldn't, burn cds i mean to, to pick up like the, the equivalent burner even back then it was about about 1500 to 2000 pounds which was a lot of lot of money uh in the mid 90s especially so all the console manufacturers especially those like development sorry dependent on carts and, and hard fix things were starting to look at cd and just think well this is it's really cheap to produce i mean you look at say, a cartridge on the other systems and, and those in turn are usually worth like about twenty to thirty pound to uh, produce on, and I'm sure as, you, as it went on, you know, the, the costs were dropping and stuff. But 
you'd look at a CD when it was mass producing. It'd be it's like pence compared to pounds and pounds for a single cartridge. And if you bought a, as a company, you bought say 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 of them to stockpile and sell out. Much easier to destroy a load of them if it's a really poor game with poor sales and say, uh, having to ditch all these cartridges. And as, as cartridges went through this situation, a lot of them, they would rejig some of the insides and uh, I think would rebadge stuff just to uh, try and sneak it out. But I, I might be wrong on that one. That's just my uh, dodgy knowledge of the, the console market at the time. Now, David Pleasance, the, what's going on, the, the Commodore marketing director, pretty much the, the driving force behind the, most of the huge uh, Amiga sales, especially uh, for the time. Now, he said in an interview with uh, Amiga Format, uh, that they, they made a huge mistake uh, with the publishers. A number of them were told about a CD add-on for the Amiga 1200. This is coming up to the, the launch of the system. So, yeah, so they've, they've, uh, they've announced that they're going to have a CD add-on for the A1200. Everyone's very excited about that. Uh, and at the same time, they're going to be releasing a new CD product. And of course, everyone's pausing and holding out thinking, well, what is this this going to mean? You know, we're trying to develop games and things. There's a hint there might be some sort of console there. At the same time, we need to produce games to go on the the A1200 with a CD unit. So a lot of uh, uh, a lot of confusion. So they started to develop uh, games with like sort of both like a CD system in mind because they didn't have any sort of idea what sort of things the console would be doing, but they knew that the the CD system would be a, a bit of a general uh, 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 jack of all trades, if you will. Uh, so they scaled all the games. They knew what the specs of the console was going to be. Uh, and they started scaling all the games around the A1200 because they had a rough idea. And this is probably where the Akiko chip just dropped off the market. But the problem was because they didn't have any design or ideas for the controller, none of them that they developed for would actually match the CD32 controls or take advantage of all the extra buttons. And when you've got the A1200, which is as default, just it can use more, but by default it would just use uh, um, one control button for like fire or ball, whatever. Uh, even though the CD32 had four, they just skipped it entirely, and and it, it created this very odd situation because it was such a, a, a small launch window that they were coming up to. They, they really didn't take advantage of it, and looking back at it, it would have been so much better if they had. If, Merge the either merge the two together or split them off specifically and and produce more information. But this ties in with uh, Commodore's st- story later on down the line and how they were struggling as well at the time to produce software and again get things done because they just didn't have any money around about this period. The console launched in 1993 to quite a lot of fanfare. Everyone, everyone was very excited about this for the time. Uh, now, it only came out in Canada and the UK. Now, from what I could see, there's no actual official uh, sales figures, but looking at things like serial numbers, it's possible to, to work out that they sold at least 100,000 across U- Europe, and a lot of that came from the fact that you could tell from numbers produced in, Ger- in Germany and the factories and stuff at the time, uh, showed that there was quite a huge list at least. But they had massive problems with like, uh, component, uh, uh suppliers. Uh, so they struggled to meet any sort of like sales target. And it was pretty poor though when you compare it to some, something like say the Amiga Batman pack, which, uh, sold like it was at least a million. It, it, it was you know, massive, massive numbers. And, and, and Amiga and Commodore at the time were doing incredibly well. And it's very far from uh, what they could have been capable to do. Especially that uh, around about this time, everyone was going crazy for it because, you know, you only had like the SNES, uh, uh, and the Mega Drive, you know, there wasn't really anything like to this level of, of, of tech or anything capable of doing the stuff that this was hinted at being able to do. So there's a lot of excitement around it and people were really excited, wanted it to, uh, uh, you know, like Christmas presents and things like that. And it was priced quite well. Uh, Lark price was £299, which was quite acceptable for consoles at the time. I mean, just look at the Mega CD. Uh, that, to get a full unit of that needed, uh, £370, just, which is effectively just for the CD drive. Then you'd have to pay out an extra £100, I think £99.99, but, uh, for the actual Mega Drive itself to run these two together. And then here you go, you've got this Amiga CD 
the CD32 slap bang in the middle, nice and cheap, it runs everything, it's much better, it's much more powerful, and, and the hint was there's loads and loads of games coming, they're announcing things like 100 games within the first year or two, you know, they really were pushing, a lot of this was down to David Pleasance, of course, doing his, his salesman spiel, but for the time, there was a lot of hints that this market was going to be huge. Commodore even dropped the price of the Amiga 1200 to £299, which was supposed to be a, a huge boost to help, uh, you know, help boost the sale. Because you'd look at that in the shop and you'd just think, well, should I get a console version, which can play with all these awesome games? And yeah, some of them will be similar to A1200, but it's something else entirely. Or I could go down the route of, oh, well, my mum and dad are quite annoyed. They don't really want me getting a game system. Uh, what they, they, they think I'm going to be doing homework. So that typical, typical argument of all teenagers at the time. So it was quite a smart, smart move to uh, announce the same price for both of them around this period. I'm sure it had a huge boost on sales, but sadly we just, we just don't have any uh, sort of like exact sales figures. For the time, Chris Evans was a huge, uh, TV presenter in the UK. He was pretty much dragged in to promote the console and announce it on TV and radio everywhere. It was a huge, huge thing. And I have no idea how much they paid for him. But, I mean, he was doing massive, massive TV shows at the time. Things like uh, uh, Don't Forget Your Toothbrush, I think, and, and like Big Breakfast and things like that. He was quite young. And it, later on, they had problems with him because he, he went a, he went the way of a radio star and they couldn't really control him. And he got too big for his boots and stuff. But... This was prime Chris Evans time and he was the perfect match for it. He was, he was, I suppose he was young, attractive and, and he was the face of, of a company and he really could make a brand and it was a good idea to, uh, to get him involved. The marketing campaign as a whole was very, very active and, and one of uh, David Pleasance's proudest uh, memories is, is getting a billboard. Uh, this is so, so funny because there's still pictures of it online. Uh, basically took out uh, uh, an advertisement on a billboard right outside the uh, Sega headquarters in the UK that said, to be this good would take Sega ages and plastered up a, a picture of the CD32. And I'm sure at the time that just drove Sega up the wall, but it was such a, a, a loud and a, a big challenge for it. And you really want them to, uh, to come out fighting on top. Because, I mean, at the time, even though Commodore were a huge company, they were, you know, they were all based around computers, consoles, stuff like that. It really wasn't their thing. So for them to step into this market and to have such a huge challenge and so on, it was, it was quite impressive. Now, I said before, for the launch, Commodore had promised around about 100 games. Uh, only 18 of them seemed to actually meet that launch window. Now, I, as a launch window, I usually class that, that down to about a month and that's going off for more modern things. Uh, many of the games, I'm afraid, were just Amiga 1200 ports. But I suppose that's typical if you've got something like this, because a lot of the companies are trying to get used to the system, they try to uh, announce things quickly, and they've been that mess up before with the CD add-on for the 1200 and stuff. But the problem with that is, this is a brand new system. People will be very, very excited. You go down the shop and you see like a, a CD version of game you can buy on your Amiga. And it, it's just not very impressive. It is not a, a big pile of launch game straight away. And a, and a, a lot of these are just ports. And it's just like, well, these are actually dearer than what I can pay from a floppy disk. And there's lots of promise that these are much better versions of games. Uh, but a lot of them, you know, they just had some extra music that would be running off the CD or like a, an FMV intro. But people just expected something better uh, from a console. They didn't just want the same old thing that another system had. They wanted a reason to go out and buy it, so it was a huge, huge problem. Uh, now, the st extra storage on the CDs, it, it, it did mean that they could do things like, uh, especially with the size of Amiga, game, Amiga games, they could do like uh, huge collections, and they ported things like uh, the Dizzy 6, which was a collection of Amiga Dizzy games, uh, like the entire Lotus trilogy, which is a very, very good uh, collection of things. Uh, then you've got things like the, the Alien Breed, sorry, the Team 17 games as well. And this was just because, you know, most of these games are on just a few floppies and if you, you could stick, you could probably stuck up, done big compilations of 10 to 20, 30, 40 games if they wanted to. And it's surprising that they, they really didn't take advantage, but I suppose at the same time it would have damaged their floppy disk market, which was 
still going by this point. It was still quite popular. Uh, but it does make you wonder uh, what it could what it could have been like at launch if they'd been able to get something like uh, Gloom or, or uh, Alien Breed 2, you know, like the 3D style. Like, been been able to be like a system launch title, something to drag people in and, and make this look different than the the competition. I mean, they, they really could have been like uh, console sellers. Sadly, the system was discontinued in April 1994. Uh, but games were produced well past when Commodore, or well, went out of business. Uh, I mean, this is when the collapse pretty much began. Uh, Commodore was running out of money. Uh, a federal judge in the US ordered an injunction against them due to an XOR patent payment. Uh, I mean, they were really struggling for money and unable to pay things like uh, uh, the Philippines uh, holding facility, which had a big pile of CD. 32s all ready for like the US launch and because of this this patent claim uh, they, they had to withhold it back for absolutely ages and they just were not able to, to release them consoles and when you're struggling for, for money really really quickly and this is all tying into the coming of back bankruptcy they they were desperate they really needed to get something out and it just they just couldn't get the money or the funds to give them it was just dodgy coming or business practice uh, and because of that, they, they soon suffered, and the system suffered as well because of it. Now, you might be thinking, oh, you, you really rushed through that and the whole system life. And it really was that quick. You know, 93 into 94, it was hardly any time for like the system to grow. There was a lot of potential there, and n none of it was really met for the initial launch. And part of it wasn't their problem. Sorry, it wasn't their fault because of things like the, the component shortages and stuff. But once that was out of the way, they really could have hit the ground running, but they were running out of money, they were running out of funds, and because of, because of that, you know, all these other companies are looking at this as a long-term, should we put in, like, you know, a lot of these games take up to two years to produce, and if you're thinking, well, this, is this company going to be along in two years' time, or should we just put our all of our resources into making stuff for the, for the other systems, and it, it really was a, a, a struggle. But because they did so well in like the initial sales and, and, and you know there's still a lot of excitement around it uh, they, they they were viable enough for, for releases to keep flowing out and it must have been a good 12 months after like Commodore had died and the, the, the system had stopped that companies were still producing games for it and, and some of the better things like Banshee and stuff came out during this period so there, there really was a, a market still available for them and which is great for if you if you're a publisher and stuff and you're trying to make sales, but not so good if, if there's no more console being produced because it, it, it's just it's a downward spiral, uh, it's just going down the down the sink. I'm afraid. Over its lifespan, there was at least 78 official games released. That's not a great number. That that sort of something like Atari Lynx numbers. I think that had 79. So that just uh, just about pipped it. But and that's a handheld system. Something else entirely. Uh, but yeah, 78 official games out of a grand total of 183, which puts it quite far ahead of a, a lot of other failed systems like, say, the Atari Jaguar, which uh, managed much, much less. Uh, now, one of the great things about this is the, the CD TV that I was uh, talking about earlier. Uh, that was really based around like Amiga 500 technology, but because the CD32 was effectively an Amiga in a box, uh, the games were compatible, so there was some ability to go back and forth between the, the, the library. Now, the problem with that is a lot of these did need a mouse, but the great thing is because they had the uh, slot on the side, you could quite easily plug one in, and it just expanded you into this huge library. Well, it's even the, the CDTV wasn't a huge library, but by this point, the, the, the prices on its games were dropping quite a lot, and it was very easy to pick up and get a lot more use out of the console because. Now, for the launch titles, I had a huge problem trying to actually get any sort of confirmation or, or nobody seems to know for sure what all the launch titles were. And I really did do some digging, but the confirmed ones that I could find were a game called Diggers by Millennium Interactive and Oscar by Flair. Now, Diggers is sort of like a, a, a Lemmings type game. It, it's a puzzler. It's a bit of an odd one to include. It's, it's not a bad game by any means, but it feels more like a mouse game rather than a controller one. Uh, Oscar is just, uh, or Oscar CD32, is just a really, 
average platformer and it's very very disappointing i mean keep in mind we are at several years after like say uh sonic uh or super mario world on the snares you know that they knew what platformers needed to be and and oscar very looked very pretty and then it took advantage of the 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 aj chipset and chipset and everything but it really was not a, a launch game. It was not the sort of thing you wanted to be demoing to attract people to the system. There was another packing later on, which included uh, Dangerous Streets, which if you're familiar with that, is an absolutely terrible game. I'm not sure what was happening at this point, but this is the company that had brought us the Batman pack, and you had such a massive Amiga library, and they really could not get these... Uh, uh, these it packings right at all and you just think a lot of this business at the time because they just wanted to clear the, the the stock of the system they were starting to drop the prices and they would be doing these huge multiple uh, uh well unofficial packings and you get things like cannon fodder thrown in there you know lots of big games and stuff which was a great bargain at the time because you'd be spending about 300 pounds and coming away with big piles of, of, of cd games but commodore officially never really like supported that it was just, it, it was a couple of games along the way and then after Dangerous Streets it just, they just sort of dropped away with it but I suppose they had the other problems on the mind. On the whole though the CD32 did quite well with, with games I mean you had things like uh, graphic adventures which included stuff like uh, speech and, and that I mean games like uh, Beneath the Steel Sky you know it was fully voiced uh, things like uh, Simon the Sorcerer that had uh, Chris Barry from the Red Dwarf series. It's a really, really excellent uh, uh, voice track. And, you know, I, I, to me, it's like it's a thing of wonder. It's always impressed me to this day. And I think there's been re-releases over the years on things like the iPad. The same with Beneath the Steel Sky. But at the time, it, it really was cutting edge. And these games weren't really going to this level, especially on the consoles and stuff. So it was quite impressive to be able to uh, to get something like that and even uh beneath the steel sky they, they hired like the entire royal shakespeare company to like to do all the voices i mean there'd been nothing like, like this before and it also had like a an extra opening comic animation when you first loaded the game you know you didn't get that on the amiga original it really was just exclusive to the cd32 they later applied it to the pc but that, that that's something different but just the fact that they were willing to do extra things with the graphic adventures but it was just a shame that the rest of the game just really didn't get that level of touch or i mean i suppose it was such a short life that you really just didn't get the chance one of the greatest things about this system i didn't mention it earlier is about these like compilation packs that where they they could put loads of game on a single cd now these were a fantastic bit of uh, value for money because it usually priced about 25 30 pounds where this is at the time when some Amiga games were like 20 to 25. And you'd have like six or seven games on a single CD. And things like the Lotus Trilogy, absolutely awesome compilation. And the Alien Breed ones all being piled on single CDs. And even though they didn't really do enough ex as extras, I mean, it's a bit disappointing to go back and play these games. Because they always have it in their mind, oh yeah, they're going to be much, much better. But they didn't really do enough. And, it, and it's just a shame. But I think it's just the time. And it was just sh such a short console life. They didn't really have the chance to do more with it. There were a number of AGA exclusive games. You have things like Alfred Chicken, which is a, a very entertainingly named uh, platformer. Things like Guardian, uh, Mist, Oscar, which was a pack in. Uh, Zul 2, which I think had extra music included, uh, and Super Stardust. Now, I'm sure if you're an Amiga fan, the AGA titles uh, really do take advantage of that's like the, the A1200's chip set. You know, it adds more colours, uh, much better looking graphics. It is, I think it's like the equivalent of, say, stepping up from EGA to VGA, but I might be a bit wrong there. But it, compared to the standard Amiga, like the A500 and the 600, it, it's just a completely on another level. There were, sadly, very few CD32 exclusives, at least from what I could see of uh, uh, looking at the list of games and checking various forums and articles and stuff. Uh, but uh, a few of them I managed to find. Uh, Bump and Burn, which is basically like a, a cartoon-like racer. Uh, it did use the Akiko chip to generate tracks. That's one of very few that are uh, involved in that way. Uh, something called the Misadventures of Flink, which seems to be one of the most highly rated CD32 games. 
but that use the Akiko to generate sprite scaling and rotation effects. I've still not played that one, but that might possibly be something we'll uh, have a look at in an upcoming episode. And uh, Microcosm, which is a bit of a yucky FMV shooter game. Uh, that always reminded me of like that inner space film when it goes shrinks down and goes in a body. And I might be completely way off key there, but what can I say? That's just my uh, dodgy memory. I haven't really said anything about the uh, add-ons for the system yet, but the great thing about this, with it effectively being an A1200, you could use the ports on the back, the expansion slots, to uh, add in all sorts of, uh, of devices and extra things. Uh, there was something called the SX1 or the SX32, which allowed you to uh, expand the system with keyboards, uh, mice, floppy drives, and you know, pretty much making it out to be like a standard A1200. But they were pretty rare and expensive, I think, at the time. Uh, there has been a, a fan-made version, uh, which pretty much allowed things like, like hard drive install. So you can effectively run like a, a compact flash hard drive on a, on a, a CD32 today. That wasn't really possible back then because it was more of a hardware add-on for, for expanding it in different ways. There was also a, an MPEG FMV module. And of course, at the time, the craze was uh, video CDs, and this pretty much let you do that. I think all of the uh, the systems by the Mega CD, I think, let you do that. And again, I might be wrong. Uh, but it would also let you play some Philips CDI discs. Now, this was a pretty big thing at the time. Uh, I think it, you couldn't really get much high-quality video out of CDs. It was very blocky and pixelated, and, and it... Really, it looked awful to be terrible, and it's, it's no surprise that it didn't take off. I mean, as a collector myself, for all retro stuff and games and things, I actually dabble in uh, laser discs. So I've got a rather large collection. I absolutely love getting hold of them because the uh, laser disc is about the size of an old vinyl. It's in this huge case, and it's all like dedicated films and pictures, and these all fold out into these. Uh, Hughes like uh, uh, making of details and he effectively writes small novels inside and put in full pictures and behind the scenes stuff. There's some absolutely fantastic things when you get down to some of the stuff like Star Wars. But the CDI, I mean, that, sorry, the, 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 the CD unit for these for the movies, they, they just didn't really compare because laser quizzes, uh, laser, laser quest, laser disc is almost on the same level as DVD and it's pretty old, like 80s maybe even late 70s tech, so it had been around for a while, and they were expecting people to suddenly switch over to CD just because it's a smaller format, but for it to be like a, a terrible bit rate and stuff. Anyway, it's not worth bothering through. It's a, a bit of failed technology on the uh, on the CD side. One of the interesting things with the system, especially at the time, is you had like these uh, public de domain mail companies, which would like fire out loads and loads of floppy disks packed with games and things, but... Uh, a CD with, with, with megabytes and megabytes of information which were dirt cheap and so they would actually compile these massive collections and sell them off and you could effectively buy like shareware pack CDs with, with, with games you could demo and play and then you, you know you maybe send a check off to someone and they'd send you another, uh, another copy or there'd be stuff like, like freeware discs effectively with loads and loads of games on it now a, a lot of these were meant for like uh, to be played on the A1200 really but I mean you could load them just as easily from like the, the CD32 and some of them, the smaller companies did take advantage of it. and it was just a, an interesting thing for them to do at the time. Now a couple of uh, interesting things I managed to find out for this system whilst I was doing some digging, uh, especially for like trivia style things. Uh, originally 109 CD32s were used to run interactive exhibits at the London Transport Museum in Covent Garden. Simple things like sound, pictures and text for information uh, with a London underground simulator. Well, I couldn't find any sort of like footage on that. It was only here saying people mentioned and I have no idea how that would have actually displayed. I suppose it's similar to the uh, Encarta type stuff you'd have seen back in the day or possibly at museums and you'd be seeing sounds like little walk arounds and simple videos and things. But just the fact that they, these actual consoles were but being used well beyond their, their, their original purpose. I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, the CD32 as well, uh, it does get touted as the first 32-bit system, but from what I could find out, uh, find out the uh, the J Japanese FN Towns Marty 
actually beat it to the market, though they pretty much never shared the same territory. And of course, especially in the UK, they're not going to really be aware of the, the, the Japanese market beyond the, the initial stages. So uh, I'm not sure what to say. The fact that the CD32 came out in more than one market and, and the FM Towns didn't mean, I think, yeah, we'll stick it. We'll, we'll let the CD32 keep that because it's, it's something a little bit special. The homebrew scene has pretty much carried on uh, uh, regardless, but they do look on the, the CD32 a lot more fondly because most of it is, it, it's a lot easier to load the games and stuff on that. But if you want any, like, CD compilations or anything that's been made recently, there's a chap called Amiga J. I've mentioned him many times before. But if you go to cd32covers.blogspot.com, he compiles like huge CDs packed with, with like piles and piles of games, like, like 30, 40, 50 original Amiga games, and he repacks them from WHD load and stuff and pretty much play all the big Amiga games and stuff, and he really does have a fantastic site for it. I believe he's also been working on a CD32 printed magazine, so just pop along to his site because it's, it's well worth having a look. Well, after all that, we need to conclude a bit and pull all this together. I know I've uh, hit as many areas as possible. I've really I've done some uh, real digging and, and research to try and find out stuff about this system, and it was such a short lifespan. Uh, so, yeah, to conclude, I mean, that controller is it's terrible. It, it needs winging in the bin. The problem is it is shaped like a boomerang. It's more likely going to come flying back and bonk you on the top of the head. It really is a terrible bit of kit. I mean, I tried to get on with it. I've owned a couple of them in the past. I really just cannot get onto it. Not when you can get something like the Competition Pro or get a converted Mega Drive. Part. I mean, it, it, they're just so much better. That that those are designed to play games properly. Whereas the CD32 on with its terrible D-pad, it's I really wouldn't bother. It's just not worth messing around with. The console came out at just at such an odd time, you know. It's right before the, the the whole PlayStation boom where everyone was going like 32-bit and everything was uh, taking off. You know, the PlayStation pretty much changed the face of uh, uh, console gaming. I'm pretty sure that if Commodore had been able to get its act together, they wouldn't have been struggling in, in other areas. If they'd been able to sink some uh, cash into this, you know, really invest with it, like all the other big companies were doing, I suppose it's a sign of a time when a, a, a company's failing and they can't market things properly. I mean, this system could have been something special. It was, it was leagues ahead of the other console. It, it, it was priced cheaper. It had the ability to play better games, but they really just didn't get there, and I think a lot of it was down to the timing. Maybe if they'd had another six months before, prior to when like Commodore was starting to fail and suffer from uh, strap cash and funding and so on, they've had a, a much better, a much better chance. The games for it, are pretty much on the most part, pretty good for what you know. What are effectively uh, a twelve hundred ports? You know, when you start looking at the likes of Gloom. You know, it, it's obvious that the console could do a lot more. I mean, in recent times, people have been able to port like, I think it's Doom or Doom 2, and this system is able to run it. And I am suspect we wouldn't have been able to get anything as amazing as that like back in the day because there just wasn't enough time. But the fact is, there was power there behind this system to be able to run it, and they just, they just didn't get the chance to. The end was nigh pretty much from the off, you know, it had a, a, a dodgy launch, it never ain't really came together and the system just vanished into nothing and, and developers tried to support it for a year or so after and, which is fair enough, I suppose, because it, it still did at least a hundred thousand. So there was a lot of them sat out there, but you know, it was just too little, too late. And then the PlayStation thing all kicked off and everything started to change. I mean, it's a neat, uh, attractive, compact design. I really like that tombstone flip-top lid. You know, I mean, it escapes like the the problems you get with other systems where they've got like a, on the Mega CD or the 3DO and you press a button and the mechanism whirs and it pushes the drawer out and stuff. Very nice and fine for the time, I suppose. But going back to it, especially in more recent times, a lot of these are starting to fail or like, like the bands inside break and they've got to be maintained uh, 
constantly, you've got to keep an eye on them and stuff like that. CD32, nice and simple, you just prop that lid up. I mean, even if the lid breaks off, because I've had one in the past where it, it was completely uh, smashed on top and cracked down the middle, I was able to just stick it together with a bit of tape and it wouldn't come all the way down, but you effectively use like a pin or something or, or, or a pen and just, just ram it down the slot at the side and it'll just fire up and rec recognise it as if it's shut. You do that with a tray and you're buggered. There was nothing wrong with the design of the console or, or the, the power behind it. Yeah, the a Kiko chip wasn't as amazing as it should have been. It was a nice little extra. It didn't, well, I suppose it's not that it wasn't amazing. It just it didn't get used to any real advantage. I mean, it, it served its perfect purpose perfectly fine, but with a bit more development time and people being able to get used to the system could have had much, much more. The uh, problem was it just didn't get uh, the, the system just didn't get enough unique software uh, or enough help from like Commodore they were in a, like, a complete financial mess and it all just sort of like limped away you know but the early days when all the press was getting on board and the marketing was kicking up and the, the, the potential for all the games and the software titles that I made you know in the first year were expecting a hundred uh, like you know CD32 games it was going to be something special and it just limped off, and that was it. It was just the end of it. None of it ever came to pass. And I think, like I say, official is like 78 games, and those are the main Commodore supported ones. And the rest of them I mentioned, they're all like either unconfirmed, unreleased, or dodgy titles here and there along the way. But it, it really does make me sit there and just think, you know, who knows what they could have achieved if it had just been released with a, a bank balance behind it, a sort of like promotion. Uh, they, they could have done to extend it more. I mean, Chris Evans was fine. That was nice and interesting, but they just didn't have the hardware to meet the initial launch. And once those problems set in from the off, it's very, very difficult to recover from it. One of the worst things for this system is it had lots of, like, really decent, you know, very good uh, uh, Amiga games with some very lazy updates, and it's very well, very well sticking on, like, extra soundtracks and stuff, and maybe the odd couple of levels here and there, but nobody went out of the way to make something super-duper for the, the, the CD32. It was just far too many uh, straight Amiga ports. Sla slap it in a... Stick it on a CD, slap it in a box. You're, you're not even, met, like, doing big box prints or anything, so they're saving money all over the show, uh, all over the show and it's just a... A shame that like Commodore didn't step in a bit like Nintendo did in the mid eighties and maybe like limit people either to amount of production or have some quality control to it and just say, you know, if you're releasing a game for this, it has to be for the CD32. It can't just be a lazy port, but they were pretty much just allowed to do whatever the hell they wanted. They could have stopped developers, you know, pushing out something really lazy as, as right from the off, it just set a very bad precedence. But, you know, they did the same with, like, that Oscar game right from the off. I mean, that was awful. That should never have been, like, a, a packing a packing title. I mean, Diggers was okay. It was more like a, a bonus game that is, than a real pack, you know. But what this should have been doing, it should have been a system seller and sticking something like Oscar in there, which doesn't really show off the system or its capabilities. It doesn't play well. And if you're right, you're in an indie shop or you've got a big gaming business and you're trying to sell this console uh, and you just stick that out with Oscar in and play it and it's just like, it's a big, clunky, slow, unhappening platform. It's not going to uh, bring people in. I mean, it reminds me in a way of like uh, what Sega did with, with Altered Beast. I mean, that was meant to be a big like arcade title. I mean, that was uh, that was my first packing game on that side back in the day. Uh, and and it really was a, an amazing looking game. It still drew you in, even though it wasn't a great game to play. It just had that look about it. You're on something special. And they later on, because they had the time, but, you know, they stuck out uh, uh, the Sonic gaming, and that was an amazing packing. And they had that chance to maybe do something here. You've got this huge Amiga library of things. You don't have to port something over, but you could have come up with something a lot, lot better, and it could have just been absolutely amazing. And But instead, we just ended up with Oscar, and it's just very, very disappointing. So, yeah, all around, very disappointing system. Had a lot of potential, which was just wasted, but I suppose it was understandable for everything that was going on with uh, Commodore at the time. 
And with that, I think we shall uh, call it a day. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, trip back down memory lane with the uh, CD32 and uh, a brief look into its history. Uh, I'm sure I've missed out many things. I did try my best to uh, dig out what I could, but, but by all means, if you uh, drop me a line saying I've missed something really obvious, then uh, you can contact me on uh, at Amigarama Pod or visit facebook.com slash Amigarama and uh, drop me a comment on there. Uh, I will get back to you guys as I always do. Until next time, thanks for listening.